prize under the, under the school for law and technology slt and in under its center for innovation in ipcil as we celebrate the world copyright day this platform serves as an opportunity to recognize and celebrate the contribution of the creators now i call upon dr ankit singh sir assistant professor of law at chennai raipur to introduce the format of the round table sir thank you very much am i audible yes sir you are audible okay. uh, respected vice chancellor sir distinguished speakers for the evening honorable registrar sir and deans respected seniors dear colleagues students and all the participants who have joined us on this platform i wish a very warm good, good evening to all of you On the August occasion of World Book and Copyright Day, I take this opportunity to welcome you all to this virtual roundtable on a very interesting subject, that is ChatGPT, beginning of the end of Juris Copyright, hosted by the Hidayatullah Exchange Academy (HEXA) and the Center for Innovation and in IP Laws School for Law and Technology, which is established under the remarkable Hub and Spoke Research Model Initiative, which is a noble vision of our dynamic Vice Chancellor sir, to embolden the university's research profile and to make HNLU a hub of research excellence. Critical and prolific discussions have surrounded the theme of AI-powered ChatGPT and its intellectual property implications. As our participants are familiar with the basic idea and theme of the event, which is quite lucidly laid out in the concept note, I'd like to quickly summarize the format of today's event. Today's roundtable discussion comprises of two legal luminaries and intellectual property experts who are going to enlighten us with their perspectives on the theme. The first speaker would be Professor Dr. Shubh Ghosh from Syracuse University, New York. and the second speaker would be dr vikas kathuria from bml munjal law school haryana this virtual round table will commence with opening remarks from our vice chancellor sir professor dr vc vivekanandan and then it will comprise of two addresses of 20 minutes each from our esteemed panelists the addresses will then be followed by a 15 minute dialogue and deliberation session in the form of a questions and answers round moderated by ms dimita mandal <clears throat> i firmly believe Now this round table will meet its objective of producing an engaging and fecund dialogue on the theme of chat gpt and copyright without any further delay i invite ms garima pawar to take things forward from you thank you so much thank you sir um as we proceed for further i would like to introduce our two eminent speakers for today professor dr shubha ghosh who is a cranwell melvin professor of law and director of technology commercial law and program of syracuse university college of law so he has earned his jd from stanford university and his phd from university of michigan his extensive research focuses on the development and commercialization of intellectual property and technology so is also a fulbright scholar to india and had been a recipient of a national endowment of the humanities research grant We have another speaker with us, that is Dr. Vikas Kathuria, sir. Sir is the associate professor at BML Munjal University, and is also affiliated researcher at the Max Planck Institute of Innovation and Competition. Sir holds a PhD degree from Tilburg University, and prior to this position, he has been also a fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, and has also worked at Scats International Think Tank as an assistant policy analyst. Now, as I proceed forward, I now welcome Professor Dr. V. C. Vivekanandan, sir, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, for the opening address. And as uh, Ankit sir has already already pointed out, this entire event has is a brainchild of V. C. V. Sir, and as he himself specializes in teaching research and advocacy in the field of intellectual property rights and internet law, I welcome sir and uh, sir, please if you can give the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Garima. I hope I am audible to from the other side. So, so let me first uh, take this opportunity to uh, welcome two of our distinguished speakers today. That is uh, Professor Subhagosh. I have a acquaintance and a working relationship for more than a decade. When he first attended, way back in two thousand five, at Malshar. Oops! Uh, in Dallas, we had a uh, ten professors from different parts of U.S., and that's how I met Professor Shubhagosh, and we were in touch. And he was kind enough once to host me in his house when he was in Texas A&M, and then very recently we met in Delhi uh, in a virtual workshop. So I invited him, and he was kind enough, even though it's going to be a little early day for him starting with this program. 
on my behalf, I'm Professor Shubha. And then I have uh, Dr. Vikas Kathuria, a professor whom I knew I had the opportunity when I was working in Bennett as a dean. He was uh, with uh, you know Bennett, and then he went on to further continue the research in Max Planck, and then he has come back and joined with the Punjab University, the law school, and he has also you know kindly agreed, and uh, it is a pleasure to again connect with uh, Dr. Vikas you know today. With this, uh, when we decided to do a, a, a workshop or a roundtable, when we are thinking. On, uh, on Copyright Day as well as World Book Day, and we were looking at uh, rather a provocative title, what you call as huge bus about chat GPT. There's a huge sense of excitement everywhere in one side and a huge sense of tension also. If I just uh, take a few minutes to tell what's happening around the world, obviously what you call as uh, this big ticket stuff is coming from you know other side of the Atlantic, and then this side of Europe is, uh, I always observe, there is to be a palpable tension between uh, the both sides of the Atlantic on many things, what's happening in the internet in the last 10 years. So you really find very recently, start with the silicon sector, there is a fierce division, according to reports from Washington Post. In that one division is headed by none other than the one of the, the newsmaker uh, of recent times, Elon Musk called, signed an open letter telling a six months pause on developing human competitive AI and he said profound risk to society and humanity. Also joined with him in the chorus was Idokowski, co-founder of the nonprofit Machine Intelligence Research Unit Institute called MIRI and said that AI development needs to be shut down worldwide. He wrote in Times Magazine open calling for American strikes on foreign data centers if necessary. So it is something which uh, uh, the ordinary people may not be even know, not knowing airstrikes on data centers. And uh, obviously, President of the United States was very cautious. He said, when asked about AI, is it dangerous? Uh, like a very good uh, uh, you know, political leader anywhere, he said, it remains to be seen. And he said, could be. So it's a very, very uh, typical uh, policy won't answer about this. But it didn't stop there. Italy was the first Western European country about a couple of weeks back to curb chat GPT and its rapid development from lawmakers and regulators. And it is not left with Italy. You really find 42 German associations and trade unions representing more than 14,000 authors and performance. Last week, urged the European Union Beef up draft artificial intelligence rules as they signaled out the threat to copyright from Chat GPT. Trade unions for the creative vector sector called Verdi and DGB and associations of photographers, designers, journalists, illustrators set out their concerns. So, in that particular thing, what they what demanded to the government was unauthorized usage, protected training material is non-transparent processing and foreseeable substitution, all that was put in. Not to be left behind, UK government recently carried out a consultation on AI and copyright. Two conflicting views emerged. Exactar, which believes in copyright to AI generation, Wongchat belongs, they said it belongs to the users, and the creative sector wants its content to be excluded from ownership completely. These things are happening I happened to read another news uh, magazine where, very interesting, Sergi Griu, who is the provost of the French Research University Sciences Po, he said, he interestingly gave a call that social science people should get involved in this AI, otherwise it will be a runaway technology. What he said is, in an in interview to World University World News, the political and social implications of AI or directly related to the ethics of AI. He said a lot of social scientists educate computer science colleagues to think about what they invent and how they should invent it. Or he goes on to say that economists and sociologists who work on inequality, for example, one can teach the AI colleagues how to develop AI algorithms that do not reproduce discrimination and bias, which is a huge issue. He gave the example of using an algorithm to sort out the CV of 
applicants for a job that it is doable by looking which candidates with which series are successful in the past and then training on algorithm using the data set to sort out the series in future. The problem is that the algorithm will reproduce the flawed human choices of the past. So the idea that a machine can replace a biased discriminating human and fix the discrimination problem is a utopia unless we involve social sciences, understand the biases and correct them at the level of algorithm. So I can keep telling about on a daily basis about worldwide uh, this thing is creating in terms of uh, chat GPT, especially we're taking A is a very broad term. I do remember that we first floated a seminar on A way back in 2013-14 in Nalsa that at the time it was too rudimentary and people thought it's some, it is some kind of fiction thing what we're talking, but it's happening around us. So interestingly, the title that we are given today is, is it the beginning of end of uh, the Judas copyright? What we meant is that, is it going to completely you know, uh, take a different thing what 300, uh, 300 years what we have been evolving into the current status of copyright, will it completely, what you call us, uh, a paradigm shift which is happening rather than acceleration of technology with copyright all these years. Could it, uh, could it really differently, differently look at it? Especially this being, what I call, a big ticket stuff from big ticket, you know, techno giants. And on the other side is that the ordinary person wants success, the ordinary person wants to enjoy. And then in between, the disseminators, I call the authors, and then uh, the publishers for disseminating such work are involved. I thought, you know, I'm going to uh, restrict my own reading and curiosity at this junction, and then move forward to listen to two of our uh, you know, speakers, uh, from one from India and one from United States, uh, what is their views and you know how they look at the whole thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And I call upon Professor Dr. Shubha Ghosh, sir, to give his remarks on the topic. <clears throat> well, thank you. <clears throat> I'm feeling an echo for some reason. Okay, maybe it's just me. Okay. All right. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. For the invitation. And uh, it was very nice to see Vice Chancellor again. After I think a few weeks. Unfortunately, it's, it's virtual, but virtual is better than nothing, I guess. So it's good to have the invitation. And um, I'll speak a little. But so many issues that have been raised here, and hope I can address them in a hopefully a good way to have a discussion. I think some of our discussion has been focused on copyright, but the vice chancellor has raised so many issues regarding um, potential access to technology, the discriminatory use of technology and uh, so on. So it has made uh, this um, discussion potentially uh, richer, more complicated. But I will um, maybe start from the focus of copyright law and work from there to address some of the other issues that um, have been raised. Hope oh, well, to hear. Okay. All right. Um, I'm not sure why I'm getting the, the reverb or the echo. So, but uh, if, if somebody can look into it, that's fine. Um, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the copyright issue. So, I think um, the starting point to think about this is first. To the way in which artificial intelligence and specifically chat GPT is another another type of uh, communication media and what we're seeing being, uh, within the world of copyright is just a, another um, 
another example of what we've seen in the past when we've had new technologies for communication emerging. And so, you know, we had this issue, of course, with the printing press, where we sometimes think about this as the uh, origins of copyright. But at the time, the the notion of um, of creating a mechanized form of writing with the printing press was uh, of upsetting more of the manuscript or the written form of, or the oral forms of writing and communication. And of course, in the you know last several centuries, we've seen other types of communication technologies that have come into uh, to play. Uh, to give the example of things like photographs and recordings, and and of course to fast forward to the internet. And when we think about the Chat GPT, just to remind us of the uh, the the terminology of what's happening here. I mean, we hear different terminologies that have come up such as artificial intelligence is a very broad also there's a concept we're talking about of machine learning that has come up several times and seems to have gotten into the background or just accepted as a technology as a way of uh, processing data but with chat gpt is a really is a form of mach machine learning and now takes the form to fill out the acronym of generative pre-training transformer. And that those letters, those words are very uh, revealing for the purposes of this type of communication technology. And um, just to uh, get a sense of what that might mean, this idea of generative is that the the medium is not passive. The medium itself interacts in a way that is, is quite dramatic compared to other interactive media that uh, we are familiar with. It's certainly when we're thinking about media like video games or certain types of interactive uh, movies, certain types of interactions that can occur with um, the distribution of playing of music, such as streaming services like Spotify and so forth. Generative is the it's really the next, next generation in the sense that the medium itself seems to have a a uh, creative dimension to it. And this then raises the question of, you know, should we recognize copyright in these works and who should own the copyright? To what extent is the medium or the technology a copyright owner? What does that mean to recognize um, some degree of personhood and legal rights in these uh, basically just uh, mechanical, electric, <laughs> electronic objects. Um, but then we see the next part of this, which is the P, uh, the, the pre-trained. Uh, that's very revealing <laughs> because it's generative only because it's been trained to do so it's been programmed to do so and you know, this is where we get back to the underlying machine learning aspect of this which is that we've set up uh, a, a system a set of algorithms and set of protocols that allow the um the system the program to generate these outputs. And so now we need to think about how it's been pre-trained. What does that mean for this, this uh, medium 
to actually be trained to do so. And it's very different than other media. Uh, if you think about radio or television or the internet itself, which obviously has some underlying technological hardware and then software protocols that allow the medium to function. Here, the pre-training has to do with both the data, the inputs, which we see with chat GPT is, as I think I've heard, the entire internet. <laughs> so not only have we gone beyond different medium, we're actually going past the internet. I mean, this is not internet 2.0, maybe 3.0, 4.0, in the sense that we're, we're looking at the date, the internet itself as a landscape, as, as a large database that the chat GPT algorithms can tap in order to generate these particular contexts. So this is the question that, that, that the vice chancellor raised about um, traditional, I'm going to use the phrase traditional copyright owners, the musicians, the, the novelists, the writers, um, and so forth, who have um, produced the content that's in this giant meta database. What does it mean for them to withdraw to chat GPT? Um, how can they withdraw? Um, is it just simply saying that in order to use their content in the database, this is another uh, licensing that's required? Or is it to say that for the output of ChatGPT, these content creators now have a right in whatever that output might be. And that right might be, uh, again, money-based. It might be a, a license. It may be a compensation for copying or creating derivative works. Uh, maybe it can be as strong as, as an injunction saying that these couldn't stop. I mean, I don't know if it'll go that far. Um, maybe it won't even get far to the licensing. In other words, we, we have licensing systems in music and, uh, and other media. Uh, so maybe there will be some performing rights organization that be very expansive that will respond to these needs. Uh, more likely, as we're seeing in U.S. law, there's a good argument that this this pre-training, if you will, aspect that reduce, that that gets us to the generation, maybe a type of fair use. Uh, we've seen this in other areas where content is used as an input in order to generate creative outputs. We see this in the area of, for example, parity and critical commentary. Uh, we see this in um, areas involving interoperability in the video game area space. Um, so perhaps this is what is the, the direction this will be having within regimes that recognize fair use, of course, which is fairly maybe expansive when you think about the U.S., or I'll use the uh, word hegemonic, but nonetheless, in terms of jurisdictions, uh, may not be that common or may not be that accepted. So that is a, a useful debate to see how that develops, it's a continuing debate about fair use. So this then ends us with the T, uh, the transformer. The idea is that through this algorithm, the, the inputs that have been pre-trained then can be transformed into some other communicative or expressive form. And so we see that, I think most recently, uh, there was a uh, 
music area where the use of some of these interactive or GPT technologies allow a creative person to write a song. They have an original song, but then they can use the GPT algorithms to mimic the style, uh, the mimic the um, genre, if you will, of various uh, artists. So the one that is getting some um, press in the US, uh, I've been interviewed about this, and I've not actually listened to the song yet, but it involves a person who wrote his own song, but was able to sing it using these GPT technologies in the style of the art of this Drake and Weekend. And that's raised some issues about what intellectual property might be implicated uh, through that, if, if any, and what this means for the music industry, what this might mean for other creative industries. Um, frankly, of course, we don't know. Part of the answer might have to do with the demand, the market for uh, these types of generated songs, songs that are developed or, or performed in the style of other artists. So it sounds like them. Now, as I understand it, this particular artist was um, distributing the song, I believe, through TikTok or some other platform. I, I think TikTok is banned as I understand, but, uh, but um, other platforms that would probably be available there. And it got, uh, I've heard, I've not seen this, a million hits. So that might speak to many things. It might speak to the potential popularity and the market demand for this. It might have to do with um, just the curiosity. You know, people the first time has done this, and then they want to hear, see what it is. Maybe it also has to do with the fan base for Drake and Weekend, who think that this might be associated. We, we don't know. We have to take that apart and see how the market. But certainly, you know, one of the things that chat GPT in this context shows is, is it's another uh, communicative medium like karaoke <laughs> or autotunes, um, another way of creating creative works or creating imaginative expressive works. And, uh, you know, there may be a market for that. How big that market is and how disruptive the market is is uh, yet to be uh, determined, determined. So, of course, you know, we get into the usual uh, chicken and egg problem that uh, what should lead? Should copyright law be proactive and say, well, we should try to put some limits on the development of this market for potential harm or the imagined harms to traditional copyright owners or established copyright owners? Or should we wait and see how this develops? And then in response, we can use copyright and other tools to somehow regulate that market as necessary. And I tend to be on more of the wait and see approach but I imagine there may be many who are concerned that this technology can get out of hand. I don't know about these fears. Um, I do tend to think that we go towards moral panic whenever there's communicative, expressive, or, or inventive technologies. Uh, and I think with these types of things, what I've seen, there's some interesting developments, and it's 
probably worthwhile to see how these types of uses and markets and media develop before we start to intervene too heavily if, if needed. That's what's happened in the past. That's what happened with photographs, what happened with the phonograph, with the radio, with television, with movies, and of course with the internet. So with the internet, it moved very quickly. <laughs> Maybe that's the, that's the uh, sign of the digital era. But I hope we don't move too quickly in this area because I'm not certain about how large the risks are. And I do see, see some creative potential, though I'm not sure how great it is, but still it's there. That's worth uh, waiting and see before we intervene further. So I apologize a bit for the echo. I don't know if anybody else is hearing it, but I'm hearing it for some reason. So if it hasn't affected uh, your hearing, I'm, I'm glad. So I will now uh, turn it over to my uh, co-panelist, and I look forward to hearing his thoughts. Thank you, Professor Vivek. And, and, oh, sorry, Gariman, you go ahead. You, uh, you can proceed, sir. Thank you so much. I'm so excited after hearing Shubha's uh, thoughts on the issue. Thank you, Professor Vivekananda. Thank you for inviting me. Well, a disclaimer, I'm not an expert on copyright, and especially in the in your presence and uh, Shubha's presence, I, I, I feel a bit shy. But I'm usually and generally uh, interested in technology. At Max Planck, we were sitting with uh, software engineers. We were trying to understand how the so-called black box of AI actually works to understand, like, you know, whether to, uh, you know, uh, how we can apply intellectual property laws, where to give uh, you know intellectual property protection to the technology that goes inside the black box. So I think now the need has come. Not that the lawyers were not sitting with uh, uh, you know engineers and those who understand technology better than uh, we do. Now the time has come to engage more, you know, closely. In principle, so far as copyright and uh, chat GPT is concerned, I concur with Chuba. Completely, like you know, these are early days, and if you look at the technology from uh, just one standpoint, you're bound to make mistakes. Because when I speak to my friends who are working on machine learning, artificial intelligence, and substrata uh, of this technology, you get to see that they are very different from each other. Like sometimes a particular uh, output has been trained on millions and billions of input, and you know some of them. Uh, might have copyright on them. But the idea is that, like, has the output really taken the expression or it has just taken the ideas? So here I'm just coming to the fair use uh, exception. So is this trans transformative or not? So as Shubha said that, perhaps, yes, it could be an exception. It could fall under the fair use doctrine. And and, and we have to see, like, in terms of chat GPT and uh, the similar uh, technology, what are the contours of... Uh, of uh, uh, this uh, exception, and we'll get to see in this Andy Warhol Foundation case, you know, it's going to throw up some more light on it. Yeah. However, you know, uh, as, as Subha uh, gave this example, which uh, Lamdi also takes in his paper, right, Fair Learning, there are certain cases which are perhaps not falling under this exception when you are uh, uh, giving this uh, technology that, you know, uh, this uh, uh, pointers that. Uh, may complete the song in the style of a different artist. So in this case, perhaps copyright should take cognizance of the output, yeah? So basically it depends upon what we are talking about. The outputs are not similar. They are very different from each other. So this is uh, where I stop so far as copyright and uh, uh, chat GPT is concerned. And uh, my thoughts are not very different from what Shubha has said. The second thing like uh, Professor Vivekanand, then you expanded the, uh, uh, you know, the remit of uh, this uh, particular event by also mentioning issues related to uh, ethics and transparency. When I talk to my friends who are working with this technology, I get to know that it's just not the, we, we have, we are no longer in the stage where uh, these, this technology is only predictive. 
it takes the text or you know an idea from millions and billions of text and just tells you that you know what is going to be the next thing it it like you look at the basic model 1000 dogs supervised learning and it can tell you like like the next picture whether it is the dog or a cat that's very basic we are done with that era now the technology has become analytical so to give you just one example you show the technology that there is a guy with a balloon and with scissors in his hand and you ask the technology what's going to happen next and the technology can actually predict that look this guy is going to cut off the wire or the thread and this balloon is going to go, fly off so it is now acquiring analytical capabilities and that's where we need to worry about that's where we need to think about ethics and somehow law hasn't been embedded like professor vivekanand you can go on speaking about law and ethics like i'm not going to get into it this is perhaps your field but you we know law is a sponge which has already absorbed a lot a lot from ethics and that's why i think the time has come for us social science people to sit down with these technology people to tell them that look what is acceptable what is not if i tell you if i tell this uh, technology to optimize the G gdp not optimize perhaps that's the wrong indicator if i say that maximize the gdp and it has a quite analytical capability perhaps the answer would be just wipe off particular you know uh, poor below a particular threshold but we know that that's not ethical maybe utilitarian but that's not fair so this is something which we have to really be careful about and i think that our stress our focus of the legal community should be at the right place so far as the copyright thing is concerned yeah let's wait and watch we should not be stifling innovation because that's very important let's not put the cart before the horses but there are other more important issues that haven't been dealt with and the technology is just zooming past and that's when we need to pay attention so this was the ethical thing data protection yes the example that you gave professor vivekananda it was on the ground in italy it was on the ground of violation of data protection rights like you are copying and you are taking personal data of people that they haven't consented for now this is a violation of data protection laws and that's where we need to look at and also now that we are talking about i remember that a month back since i keep my uh, an eye on technology i was very worried about students and their assignments i said to uh, my dean and my uh, colleagues is it the end of take home assignment chat gpt how do we go about this i was very much worried right because we need to teach our students how to write that's that's a very important part of law school learning so what happened like a couple of weeks back uh, some students told me that uh, professor now turnitin has this new tool that could actually tell you that you know whether the text has been taken from or generated by you know ai uh, generated technology so that means you know the machine is giving answers to the problem that were created by machines like matrix right machines fighting each other so wait and watch i think we are not living in dystopian world of course there are real issues but we need to go slow we need to understand we need to target our energy on the areas that are most relevant most useful now this turn it an example i can uh, tell you that you know some technical solutions have been proposed so far as the copyright issues is concerned i'm not sure if you've heard of stack stack is a data set for training ai des uh, designed to avoid copyright infringement issues it includes only code with permissive open source licensing and offers developers an easy way to remove their data on request so here you see you know there is a new technology which is trying to you know trying to uh, tackle with the challenges thrown up by different kind of technology again deviant act has already uh, has created metadata tag for images shared on the web that wants ai researcher not to scrape their content so we live in a in times that are very interesting that will have profound implications for the coming generation coming times and that's why the responsibility is on us to be judicious with the power that has been given to us so i would concur with professor gosh let's let's go slow try to understand the technology and for students i can tell that this is an opportunity to you know understand what law is in the past law took a lot from sociology political science economics learned a lot from psychology right so 
but now time has come for you to sit down with people who study engineering, software engineering, etc., and trying to learn a lot from them and in turn also influence the way they think. It's not about utilitarianism. It's also about fairness. And fairness is a term which is, which is very ambiguous, but which is now increasingly being adopted in mainstream law, at least in competition law. If you look at uh, the DMA, Digital Markets Act, for a long time, we made mistakes. We could not understand why Facebook was acquiring WhatsApp. We could not understand why Facebook was acquiring Insta. We just thought that, okay, it's fine. But then later on, we realized that it was a mistake to pass those mergers because they were killer acquisitions. Sometimes we didn't even have the tools, right, to understand or to make intervention in the market. So law, you know, law had its own trajectory. We had to learn. We understood that the technology and the corresponding economics of digital markets are very different. And that's why we enhanced our digital toolkit in the form of Digital Market Act. Indians, we are deliberating our own brand of XNT regulation. So law always tries to, you know, play catch up with technology. But the idea is not to live in the dystopian world, but to be very practical and focus where the problem lies. That's where I stop. I'll be very happy to take up questions. Over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I'm call upon to, uh, Ms. Devita Ma'am to kindly proceed the question answer session. Ma'am, you're not audible. Ma'am, you're not audible. I'm sorry. By the time ma'am uh, ma connects back, I had a query that do you think that the doctrines of sweat of the brow or the modicum of creativity is now redundant, especially in the era of artificial intelligence that we are living in? Um, Sorry, ma'am, am I audible now? Yes, ma'am, you are. Ma'am, I have posed one question. Uh, yes. I request Shubha sir or uh, Vikas sir, either of them to answer for this one. Sure, I, I can start the answer. I think I understand well, why there's a echo for me. It seems I'm logged on twice. Um, so I don't know if somebody can remove the other uh, yes, log sir. on, but, but I'll try to answer uh, the question or start answering the question. Um, well, I think it's, at least within the U.S. copyright tradition, it has been redundant for a while, even before AI. Um, I'm actually wondering, and I'm thinking there about the Feist decision, which, uh, of, of, you know, had to do with uh, copyright and compilations and databases. And specifically, that case um, seemed to reject the sweat of the brow. Um, now, of course, in other jurisdictions, there are aspects uh, of what you described, the modicum of creativity that might uh, still persist and, persist and come up in the area of databases. So, I guess the question is the viability um, for what purpose? So there are two issues. One is the issue of copyright ownership, which many jurisdictions seem to resolve by saying that, well, it has to be a human being who is the rights holder, which uh, is uh, it's kind of an artificial a solution taking us back to um, really the question of originality and sweat of brow without really answering the question. Um, so perhaps the sweat of the brow could arise again in a couple of ways, or at least the debate over sweat of the brow. 
and modicum, modicum of creativity can arise in two ways. One is to what extent, if we look for a human to be the copyright owner, what have they provided? What is the modicum? Um, have they only provided sweat of the brow in running the algorithm, so to speak, or setting up the algorithm? Um, and of course, if we get rid of the human, then the question is whether a machine does have a modem of creativity or is that something else? So there's that. And then we get into these issues, not only from the um, psychology of whoever the originator is, the works, but also in terms of the work itself, uh, how do we identify aspects of the work that are just purely for functional results rather than creative expression, which is uh, uh, in part, but very small part, an idea expression issue. But when you're dealing with software-based creations, it gets into very broader issues as to whether you're granting copyright protection to a process, a method, a system, rather than to what it's copyright is supposed to provide protection to, which is creative expression. So that's my answer. So I attempted an answer. So. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Perhaps Professor Vikas can answer this. Would chat GPT be considered to be engaging in unfair competition? when it is mimicking these artists or uh, like musicians or it is passing off text like one of the examples uh, you gave is that chat gpt is actually uh generating text or answers with fake uh quotations which i have also tried and see so would that be a case of unfair competition or how it is affecting unfair competition per se thank you Devamita. thank you for this question it's a very interesting question you see if i look at it from the standpoint of competition law i would try to understand it from the uh, you know uh, from the perspective of relevant market like <clears throat> something that is created by an artist and something that is created by chat gpt there are two different things altogether they do not fall in the same relevant market and hence they do not compete with each other that's that's my understanding of uh, you know the output generated by uh, uh, chat gpt so it does not distort competition as such. What it does, however, it expands the market, which in and of itself is a good thing. And here I am referring to innovation. You know, innovation, like the way, you know, we are meeting on this uh, virtual platform, it's innovation, right? And innovation, like, you know, is a good thing to begin with. So, and if you look at chat GPT, uh, we are using 3.5, right? If you're not paying for it, okay? So that's the difference between the picture of uh, uh, our uh, uh, beautiful Mother Earth and uh, the difference between this Earth and the, the and the picture of the entire universe when it comes to chat GPT-4. Such is the stark difference between the data set used by these uh, two different uh, generations of chat GPT. So, and even now, this basic version that you and I are using, it's not optimal. It has certain hallucinations. I'm not sure if you have noticed that sometimes when you give prompts to chat GPT, it gives you certain uh, queries uh, or answers that are absurd in nature. I, I Have you seen it? Like, you know, uh, you experimented with it. So it, it, what does it show? It shows that it's not optimal. So let it train, let it grow stronger, which is a good thing. But yeah, taking a step back and answer your question, I don't think it is stifling competition uh, in any way. It is rather expanding the market. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, another question which is there I can see is that, whether uh, there is a need for revamping within the copyright law, the technological prote uh, protection measures like the TPM measures. Uh, if Professor Shuva could take up this question, because of the impact of chat GPT, do you think there is a need of revamping 
the TPM measures as embodied within the WCT, WPPT. I think we have to wait and see again. Um, I, I guess the question is how far this technology will go to um, challenge the notice of takedown procedures that we have now. It, as, as I see it, I mean, the issue is whether it, it, it's a variation what uh, Lucas mentioned a few minutes ago regarding um, the law being able to catch up with these types of um, technologies. If GPT generates much copyright infringing output, okay, maybe notice and take down would not be able to keep up with these types of procedures, which of course raises the question of whether there may be other AI based systems, again, I'm using the AI very broadly, that can create more of an automated type of notice and take down. I mean, we sort of see this again in, in YouTube and Facebook in terms of their um, own search and detection technologies that they have to identify copyright infringement, for example, in music, which is the most common way. So that's another dimension in which the technology might develop uh, in terms of automating even the, the technology protection measures we have. And so we do need to rethink, uh, and probably already knew, need to do that now, uh, exactly what those uh, procedures will look like, even trying to think about an automated system that would protect the rights of users and creators we're uploading or downloading from content. Um, so I think the answer to your question is the general te technology that we see developing would have some influence, some impact, impact on how these um, various types of notice and takedown and, and, and other procedures are operating. And with respect to chat GPT, it, it may be a question of the existing law just keeping up with the, the possibility. And I'm a little bit I'm, I'm being a little bit cautious here as to say whether the outputs of chat GPT are infringing of copyright or not. But to the extent that ChatGPT generates this at a, an accelerated pace, then there's a question of whether the law and those procedures can keep up. Uh, thank you, Professor Shubha. Uh, we, we have a few more questions in the uh, chat box. So Prakruti is asking, at the level of constitutional policy, if a law were to be made for the outputs of interaction between human and AI, what kind of provisions must be made in order to establish a just legal procedure? Maybe more of a jurisprudential uh, outlook. So if one of the panelists can take up this question. Maybe I can try. Sure, sure. I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, but I think uh, this is uh, this is a big question rather than question. It's a concern for me because I said, like you know, the task of the law. I think uh, we should understand our limits. Our task should be to you know lubricate the market to make sure that you know if there are frictions, if there are problems, the way we understand the society to fix it through the instrument of law. But when law acquires its own identity, 
then I think it becomes problematic. Now, you know, coming down from the philosophical grounds to the practical grounds, I think technology is something, you know, when they are creating the technology, even they don't know what is going to be the outcome. Like the 2017 paper, when they are talking about, you know, uh, this, uh, the, the, the tea part, you know, uh, they did it for the translation purpose, but, but when they were talking about the technology, they wrote about the technology, they had no idea that, you know, they are giving birth to a new field of technology, you know, generative AI altogether. I'm forgetting the name of the paper. So, and, and, and at that stage, when you are witnessing the birth of technology, you bring in law, you know, I think that's a problematic part. First, just be patient to see like what is happening. And then perhaps then we can come in to understand what are the parts that are not in coherence with the society uh, and the order of the society that has been created through the instrument of law. I'm not sure if I've answered that uh, completely, but perhaps it can be contextualized and, uh, you know, it, it can it, it can be put into the context of constitutional law. Thank you. I think uh, she was asking more about the just order only. So kind of we have to wait. I agree with you. We have to wait and find out how chat GPT plays out. Uh, there is another question. This is from uh, Aarti Arya. She's asking, uh, we all know that with time chat GPT will go stronger. So how do you think uh, can creativity of human beings be saved in presence of chat GPT? What would be the necessary steps according to the panelists? Yeah, I, th I think we need to be very cautious uh, in giving ChatGPT more power than it might actually have. Um, we seem to think it's been unleashed in the world like some sort of virus, uh, but we do have control over it. Um, okay, how can creativity be saved? get off your computer pick up a guitar <laughs> go to the piano <laughs> start playing um take a pad take a pencil write some poems <laughs> write a book <laughs> take a a 35 millimeter camera go back in time <laughs> to that technology i i think so I don't mean to minimize the question. Uh, so I'm sorry if I am, but uh, I don't. Uh, you know, there are lots of ways we can be human, <laughs> and uh, being online is maybe only one small part of that. So, uh, very rightly said, Professor Shiva. There are a few more questions cropping up, so maybe I'll take one or two of them. Uh, Prajna is asking, a person with creativity can completely copy from open AI to interactive uh, and produce a PhD thesis. Maybe she is a PhD scholar or something. So how do we regulate this action? So maybe from an ethical ground, how do we regulate? At the same time, when one is applying the creativity, there should be some level of originality. What is your opinion on the scene? This is, I think, uh, Prashna is one of the PhD scholars. She's asking, what if she generates an answer from chat GPT and applies certain level of creativity? Would it be considered original? Again, the doctrine of originality. So, Professor Shubha, can you take up this question? Well, I, mean, I think for what purpose? I was just reading, reading the question in the, uh, in the chat to understand it better. Um, if you're talking about for copyright infringement i mean i think i addressed that through talking about but there's a broader issue here about uh, plagiarism which you know is related to the unfair competition question um you can have uh acts of, of taking somebody else's work or infringing or excuse me or uh, competing unfairly with them that does not involve copyright infringement. So for things like a PhD thesis or any type of uh, academic 
work product, you know, the school should develop rules about plagiarism and and uh, honor code violations and so forth to deal with those issues. And it, it's, as far as the marketplace goes, um, I mean, this is where it gets very interesting. Uh, assuming it's not copyright infringement, which some of my discussion might suggest it's not, um, there's probably an open air here. Um, maybe in some situations there might be trademark infringement, but that's a little bit probably iffy here. I mean, you're describing in some ways more uh, an action that in common law would have been called passing off. So, uh, you know, marketing a work as your own when it's not your own. And so perhaps, you know, the unfair competition realm and the, specifically the passing off realm would come up here. Um, now to go back to your question, uh, uh, the last question you have about, um, you know, I just simply took the output of chat GPT or some other technology and modify it some way. Well, uh, you know, putting aside whether that, that output of chat GPT is copyright protected, how is it different than by taking a public domain work? Uh, Dickens, you know, we can go back to other examples in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in myth mythological stories and so forth that are in the public domain. And I uh, create some other work based on that. Um, it all depends on what you add at that point, and which takes us back to this question of originality, which is um, what we have now, and independent of what the technological changes would be. So we could address it in that way, uh, rather than having to come up with any new types of uh, rules because of this technology. So I hope that was responsive. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so there are a lot more questions, but I think I'll take a last one. Um, this is from Titiksha Shivastav. She is asking that someday if we give copyright protection to chat GPT, who will become the author, the creator, the programmer, or the technology itself? And maybe if I may ask, uh, add to it, Maybe the service providers, because these chat GPTs are basically digital services. So who do you think should be given? This is a, a general question in regards to all other AI services also. Um, if one of the panelists can take up this question. I think Subha, you'll have to answer this question. So far as my response is uh, concerned, I would say the jury is still loud. So I think you, you can give a better answer. Yeah, I'm trying to, uh, I'm reading the question. Are you asking me to predict where the law will go? Or are you, are you just simply asking me what I think the answer should be? Uh, I mean, the first, if it's the first question, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I think, uh, I think it's a bit it's of a question of, okay. of how uh, computer program ownership owns and the outputs of, I mean, it's, I, I don't see a big lobby to make the technology itself uh, human. I don't see that. Where should I go? Uh, I, I, you know, I, if it's a should question, if, you know, whoever, um, I, I tend to view chat GPT as a tool. It has tool that has some interesting characteristics, uh, such as, as I mentioned before, the generative characteristic, but uh, it's the person who's using the tool uh, that 
could be the copyright owner, or, and then then it's a question of how that tool is used to express the creativity, originality of the of the user. I think it was more in a general line, but yeah, so the picture you can uh, refer to the cases which are developing in different jurisdictions, you'll get a general idea. So thank you so much panelists. There are many more questions, but on uh, time constraint will not be able to take. Oh, uh, Professor Vivekanand sir has a question. Maybe I'll pass the virtual mic to him. Uh, Devmita, let me take the privilege of designing this program to ask the last question. Right, so uh, it's a bit of a comment as well as a question. Uh, a couple of questions in that. I am. I don't know how far Subhagosh watches Indian movies, right? And the one which uh, took the world by storm a couple of years back was few years back was a movie called Bahubali, right? It's an Indian movie which ran into packed houses in the United States also, right? Other places. The which led to the second part which got unveiled in Bahubali 2. So at times when the chat GPT is the katapa who is you know, what you call as working on this so-called copyright uh, jurisprudence well, that's a topic today that called the Bahubali of IP. So in that question I want to ask one is a European scholar one is an American scholar. There has always been something outside all this debate there's always that um, United States leads and Europe reacts. If you really look at all the bans which are happening from Germany to Italy to UK, by and large, it's always, of course, when one, one acts, one reacts, and the third world watches simply. That was, that was my experience also in many times. So in that context, is it um, uh, the, a bit of uh, what I call as a, uh, uh, a kind of a fear of the unknown sometimes, and then shaking the very uh, evolved jurisprudence, which is having these reactions, sometimes to take it is, it is still, one of the speakers said it's early days. It's not just early days, it is one of the fastest catch up what is happening in technology, Visavi, which I said acceleration of technology in the last 200 years, where law could really manage. I am reminded often by a famous quote of Harold Linston of Brooklyn, who said that we are embracing technologies of the future, whereas our governance structures are one century old, and then our, you know, uh, the governing processes is further a century old. In such case, it's always law which, uh, by the time it analyzes and tries to come to some level of, you know, managing or regulating, uh, you will see the technology vanishing in the next pill, and that speed is accelerating. In such case, uh, what would be a general comment that um, is it much ado about nothing, or it is going to really uh, give a complete shakeup of the jurisprudence of copyright? I would like both of you to comment in general for a closure of this round table. Maybe start like, with the uh, Gosh. Okay, sure, sure, and then because you can have the last word, I think it's fine, it's appropriate. Um, I don't think the world is uh, is, is uh, over <laughs> of copyright. I think it's sort of you know becoming more. Um, um, no, uh, interesting. To use that phrase, you know, you know what we say about things being interesting. Um, do I think it's it's a big deal or much ado about nothing? Well, certainly not. I mean, it's it, it's an important technological development. It'll affect media. You know, part of part of my concern as a uh, professor, and actually I'll modify that with elderly professor is that I've seen a lot of these technologies over time, but you know my students may only live in a world and our students in the future where they only know ChatGPT 
Um, I think about the time period when I grew up, the 60s and 70s. Obviously, there were books. Books were there. I was very... But I lived in a world saturated with television <laughs> and movies. And so all I knew were television and movies in some ways. And so I'm a little bit concerned about what um, this technology will be for students, uh, for children, uh, for future generation that only knows the internet, <laughs> only knows, I guess in India it's not the case, but only knows TikTok videos, <laughs> uh, you know, only knows YouTube. And I hope they, that's why my comment about turning off the computer maybe has even more resonance. So I think it's important to understand these changes in a historical context. And to say that it's just simply, you know, old, old new bottles has a certain truth to it. Uh, but at the same time, you should not minimize what the potential is, um, especially for students who think that telling chat GPT to write an essay is the same thing as writing an essay. <laughs> uh, it's not. <laughs> um, I'm interested uh, to take this in another dimension, and perhaps another panel, is how, uh, and this is something I'm interested in more broadly, is the intersection between, you know, IT and the life science because we've seen, you know, I, I, I mentioned the virus very early on, uh, and we've seen such amazing developments in the development of drugs. And I'm curious about how some of these machine learning technologies, you know, can affect the life sciences, the biomedical area. Can a researcher tell chat GPT what is the best vaccine for this virus? Tell me. <laughs> right. And obviously using the relevant data sets there and the relevant algorithms. So I find that to be an interesting area uh, for us to think about uh, as the future. But again, I don't think that's destroying the future. It's just opening up some very interesting uh, possibilities. So once again, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this panel. And Vikas, you can have the last. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if, uh, if Subhas, uh, say, Grush, um, Professor Grush, I understand the upside of uh, chat GPT or driven by AI has its uh, you know upside and brighter side. And then probably it's more professors who are really rather than you know other people about what's happening here let me understand from uh professor vikas uh, his co final comments well, surely i'm not going to have final comments because after this professor vivekan and you're going to have the final word right so my penultimate uh word uh you you asked a very pertinent question this is something that we are struggling with in in our field in competition law because you see in the last 15 years, especially, the base of technology has been such that many laws were rendered redundant or, you know, incomplete so far as their efficacy is concerned. Well, in, in many realms, uh, Brussels took the lead. It came up with, uh, you know, it framed the problem uh, and it started uh, to answer the question. But the questions and answers, they both are, you know, uh, they are rooted in their own socioeconomic background, their own uh, history to a certain extent. You see, history has also affected comp the evolution of competition law in Europe. And if you look at uh, competition law, the United States only recently woke up and it realized that they had a strong overhang of Chicago school and something needed to be done. So... They are trying to frame, they are frame up their own X and tape laws. So, and so far as the third world is concerned, developing countries, I don't know. Perhaps they have to have their own model. They don't have to blindly follow Brussels or blindly follow uh, the United States. And then the contextualization requires that the transplant happens only uh, after looking 
closely at the socio-economic political backdrop of uh, third world countries. Now, so far as copyright is concerned, it's a bit different, you know, because it just does not have economic justification. It has different other justification. But it's an opportunity for our scholars to look at our administrative law, the jurisprudence, and then to see what the new, uh, you know, the pace of technology means for the backdrop that we already have. So it's a huge opportunity, and I, I, I would hope that our scholars would take up this uh, opportunity and start working on it before blindly following either the you know either side of the Atlantic. So that's where I would start. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it, and it was a great learning experience for me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I now invite Professor Dr. Yogendra Kumar Shrivastav, sir, to kindly give the vote of thanks. Sir, is the Dean PG, Dean Outreach Program and External Activities. Sir, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, a very happy World Book and Copyright Day and a warm good evening to one and all. Uh, it is a matter of sheer pleasure and honor for me to propose uh, the formal vote of thanks on for this extremely vital roundtable discussion uh, organized uh, by, under the edges of HEXA and the Center for Innovation and IP Laws, School of Law and Technology at Chennai. First and foremost, I would like to express my immense gratitude to our esteemed panelists for this session, Professor Dr. Shubha Ghosh uh, from Syracuse University and Dr. Vikas Kathuria from BM Munzal Law School. I sincerely thank uh, them for taking out time from their busy schedules. Uh, Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Kathuria uh, have really provided thought-provoking perspectives uh, and insights on the theme of this roundtable discussion. Uh, their expertise and perspectives have greatly enriched uh, our understanding of the complex issues that are surrounding copyright uh, uh, in that context of uh, AI and chat GPT. I would like to extend my gratitude to our uh, leader and mentor, uh, Professor Dr. V.C. Virekanandan, sir, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Hidayatullah Nashaw University, for his unwavering support, guidance, and motivation. Thank you very much, sir, for joining this uh, uh, important roundtable discussion. I would also like to thank uh, the organizing team and members of the Center for Innovation and IP Laws, School of Law and Technology, HNLU. Uh, Dr. Ankit Singh, uh, Ms. Devmita Mandal, and Ms. Garima Panwar for putting together this event successfully. I would also like to uh, thank members of the faculty, staff, and our dear students for their presence in this uh, virtual roundtable session. Last but not least, I would like to extend my gratitude to all the participants who have who attended this roundtable discussion. I sincerely hope that uh, the insights. Uh, gained from this discussion will help us navigate the complex landscape of uh, copyright and chat GPT. Thank you very much. Over to you, Garima. Thank you, sir. With permission of VC, sir, can we put an end to this session, sir? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks for participating. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank, you. thank you, sir. Yeah.